John Moxley has gone on Chris Jericho's podcast and spilled his guts. Welcome to a live edition of Mic Drops. How's it going, everyone? I had to come up here and talk about this. Unfortunately, it's the middle of the week and I've got to work and I did not have time to come up here and do an actual video on this subject, but I thought that I definitely had time to come up and do a live stream, and this is one of the things I wanted to incorporate into the New Look channel this summer anyway, so let's come up and do it now. Talk about uh, Sia Moxley on Chris Cabana's podcast. Fucking crazy shit. Now, there's a lot to discuss here. I don't know how long I'm going to go. The maximum this video will be is an hour. I'm going to guess more in the 30-minute range, and we're going to talk about most of the juicy bits that Moxley discussed on the podcast, and there's a lot of it. And I'm going to discuss all my thoughts on it. Um, I'm just making sure I look good and everything. I want to say hello to you guys. I will be doing some interacting with the chat, but I'm not going to do it that much. Um, I want to say hello to the folks that are in here. Over 100 people here already. A lot of people wanted to hear my opinions on this. I was getting a shit ton of tweets. So that's why I figured let's definitely come up and do a live stream. But hello to How Weezy. Cool to have a mod in here and Steven and chat site forums. David and John and Luna and Look Cool and Down Ice and Jose, Costanza, Alex, Daniel, Sony. Norab, Snapback, Crush D, Dark Rose, Ungovernable, all y'all. <clears throat> Good to have you here on a Wednesday afternoon. But uh, like I said, with the New Look channel this summer, I want to try to come up here and do more videos, more like impromptu stuff uh, that I don't have to, you know, put a ton of work into and shit like that. And that I can maybe bust out before I have to go to work and do my job and shit like that. So this is a perfect topic uh, to uh, do one of these videos on. Now, one thing I will say up front, because I was kind of late hearing this podcast, I didn't realize that this podcast was available until about four o'clock in the morning, my local time. I was I was heading to bed. I stay up really late, but I saw it at about 4 a.m. and I'm like, shit, I don't have time to listen to this. So I went and got some sleep, got up this morning and listened to it instead. And as I'm looking around, you know, YouTube and I'm looking around the Internet, I'm seeing a lot of the same headlines. I'm seeing a lot of the same titles on YouTube videos, and they all include the word bury. John Moxley buries the WWE on Talk is Jericho. And while we'll, we'll talk about what he, what he said, and he definitely voiced his frustrations 100%, I do not categorize this, his interview with Jericho, the same way as I did CM Punk's interview with Colt Cabana back in 2014. CM Punk had, I think, a lot more bitter feelings then John Moxley and CM Punk definitely buried WWE. He was the whole thing was just a profanity laced rant. Every other word was fuck, and not that Jericho and Moxley didn't use a little bit of colorful language, but it wasn't nearly as bad as the CM Punk's podcast. You could tell that CM Punk was angry, he was bitter, and he never wanted to talk to those motherfuckers again. I don't think John Moxley did the same thing. Yes, he voiced some frustration, but there's a big difference, I believe, in telling the truth like a mature adult, which I believe Moxley did, and burying the WWE. And I know the fans really want this, and this was juicy. We're going to get into it. And it was very revealing and very telling and uh, was a really strong and sobering illustration of how fucked up things are back there, especially coming from someone like Dean Ambrose, who's an upper-level talent. I mean, a lot of this shit was, was great to hear. And I know the fans automatically want to think the worst. And they got really excited. They have, they have Colt Cabana flashbacks with CM Punk. But I don't think this was the same thing. All he did was tell the truth. He was just being honest. That's it. You know, he wasn't going out trying to harm WWE. As a matter of fact, one of the first things he said in the podcast was when he left, he didn't want to ask for his release. He didn't want to do something to get fired. He wanted to ride it out, finish out his dates, finish out his contract. He didn't want to make situations awkward for his wife and shit like that. Although he might have with this uh, with this podcast, because it wasn't all happiness. You know, he definitely voiced his frustrations with WWE, but not in a angry, vindictive way like CM Punk did. CM Punk did not sound happy on Colt Cabana's podcast. Moxley, on the other hand, sounded ecstatic on Jericho's podcast said a number of times that he feels like a weight has been lifted off his shoulders. He feels free. Nobody can control him anymore. That has to be a great feeling. He seems genuinely happy and genuinely excited for his wrestling future. And when you get down to what his issues were with WWE and what we're going to talk about here, really there's only one issue. It's not like CM Punk, where he had issue after issue. He just was angry and bitter 
and aggressive towards everybody. Moxley, his only issue with working for that company appears to be creative. That's it. Otherwise, he's made great friends there. He's been treated well, paid well, met his wife there. Everything else has been great. And if he could have been creatively booked and used the way he saw fit or way he felt comfortable with, he, he would have stuck around. All of his issues are creative. All of them. Where CM Punk had a lot more issues with than that. He had heat with people. He didn't get along with Triple H. He hated that fucking doctor so much so that he talked so much damn smack. The doctor sued him and Colt Cabana. This was different. You know, I mean, yes, Dean Ambrose was definitely frustrated creatively, and he said so. But I don't think he was raking WWE over the coals. I don't think he was burying them to the degree that the fans was hoping he would. And he definitely did. He definitely said some things. But I don't think he buried them. I definitely think that nothing that he said in that podcast should blackball him from WWE. It might piss some people off. It might ruff, ruffle some feathers, especially when he's being extremely revealing about his dealings with Vince McMahon. Things like that, really pulling back that curtain. So there's, I'm sure there's going to be some hard feelings, but nothing that can't be mended. I think worse has happened before. And I still think that down the road, three, five years from now, when Dean's or when Moxley's batteries are recharged and maybe WWE has got a new look to them because they've got some competition now with All Elite Wrestling, maybe the door's open to come back in the future. So it was awesome what Dean Ambrose said. And I'm happy that somebody is now more people are coming out and holding WWE accountable for their bullshit. This was not the massacre that people are making it out to be, I don't believe. But anyway, we'll talk about what, what Moxley said. Did I see a couple of Super Chats roll in here? Let me answer those real quick, and then I'll go into my notes about some of these specifics. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yeah, there is one. Where is it? Brett, thank you, brother. Thanks for this mic drop. Absolutely. It was uh, very requested. We got over 200 folks in here right now for a Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening on the East Coast. I guess it's 7 p.m. For me, it's only 4 o'clock. So uh, pretty awesome audience. I guess a lot of people want to hear about this subject. But here's kind of some of the notes that I wrote down. Now, like I said, Jericho, first of all, this podcast was actually recorded before Double or Nothing. Jericho said that up front. He even made a little joke that had he known that he was going to get attacked by Dean Amber or by Moxley, uh, and if Moxley was there, he'd punch him in his mouth or whatever. So Jericho sold uh, the attack. And this was recorded at Moxley's house. As a matter of fact, near the end of the podcast, you actually hear Chris Jericho say hello to Renee Young, which was funny. Um, but it was recorded a couple days before Double or Nothing at Moxley's house in his kitchen with him and Jericho. And like I said, one of the first things Moxley said right up front is that he was happy, he was free, he felt um, a breath of fresh air, like new life has been breathed into him. He feels excited about the future where he was just kind of miserable and, you know, creatively stuck in WWE. He feels like reborn again, basically. And he, he made it very clear that he's very happy and he's excited. And WWE is in the past, but he needs to bring up some of the shit here. And uh, Jericho... I'm glad Jericho got this interview because I really think it was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, Ambrose also put over WWE right up front, thanked them for his time there, said he had a great time, grew up. He said, when I got there, I was a kid and I'm an adult now. I learned a lot. I grew a lot as a person and a human being. I met some of my best friends in my life there. I met my wife there. And everything about that company has been great. You know, they've given me a chance to be this person. So he had very good things to say about the company and appreciated his time there. But then shit got real. <laughs> then he started getting into the details. One of the first ones was when he first decided that he was going to leave. Apparently, he decided this way back last year in July that he was not going to be resigning his contract. And I don't remember. Was he back by then? I forgot. I can't remember when he returned from his injury. But it was way back in July that he knew he wanted to leave. But he was going to come back and let them do whatever they wanted with him creatively. And I guess the contract stuff didn't come up until January. So he knew all the way back in the summer, and between that time, he told the story of several different creative issues that we, he would have, specifically with the scripted promos and the stupid shit that they would write for him, which we all know. We watch Monday Night Raw every week, us together, on the live streams, and we wonder what the fuck we're watching and how a group of people can be actually paid handsome salaries to write this type of shit. You know, it's fucked up. So... We already knew that. 
And so for him to kind of confirm this, that yes, there are some serious creative issues there, and he pretty much confirmed what we all knew anyway, and that it's really all Vince McMahon at the end of the day. He thinks the dumbest shit is funny. Moxley said several times in the interview that writers understood. They threw their hands up in the air like, yeah, this is what you're doing. This is what Vince wants to do. It's like they can't even do anything about it. I feel like not only is the talent being held back creatively, the writers are being held back creatively because of this stupid shit. And there was a couple specific promos that he cited, but one in particular, it had something to do with, um, I don't know, pooper scoopers or something like that. It was just basically something that Dean Ambrose would not do. And he said so. He goes, this is fucking dumb. And it took a couple of rewrites and, you know, for him to reject a couple of things and then having to deal directly with Vince McMahon and have to listen to him try to pitch why this is so funny. Oh, are you kidding me, pal? This is great. This is what you do. You're a lunatic fringe or whatever. You know, Vince trying to Jedi mind trick people into seeing things his way. Dean said he fell for it a couple of times. He said one time he actually did when it came to some sort of a comment on Roman Reigns' leukemia. And Vince somehow twisted the thing around to make him think it was all right to say that. And then there's some other times where he stood his ground and says, no, I'm not going to say that. It's fucking stupid. And the constant, and we remember back then, when Ambrose came back, I thought he looked good. He was jacked all that time off he had spent in the gym. He kind of had a new new look hairstyle and just had a different sort of swagger about him. And we were all excited as fans. And they really dropped the ball on his return. He said he talked about how disappointed he was when he returned from injury. He wanted to come back at SummerSlam, and then they brought him back on Raw in an overproduced, micromanaged segment that made his uh, return fall flat. And then the constant steady stream of stupid shit they had him do, the stupid stuff they had him say in promos, and then when he was telling the story about trying to get some line about needing a pooper scooper in whatever fucking town they were in, he spent so much time getting that line out that they replaced it with like a gas mask line which wound up leading to him coming out there with a gas mask and all that which then morphed into him doing the uh getting inoculated in the doctor's office and getting shots in his ass and that was and we we remember seeing that being like what the fuck and i think he was thinking the same thing and he could not he was counting the days apparently around that time to get the hell out of that company And so when you hear stuff like that, it's really eye-opening because up until now, it's all been hearsay. You hear some writers come out and the, you know, past employees come out and do podcasts, do interviews, and they talk about this sort of thing. And we've seen a a couple of issues with the talent as well. A lot of talents ask for the release because they're creatively unhappy. This is a guy at the top of their card. This is a former world champion. This is a seven-figure-a-year guy, right? And uh, he wants to get the hell out of there. And he said, he goes, I saved my money. You know, how much money do you need? I got millions of dollars in the bank. My wife works there. You know, I'm not. He, he basically said there was no amount of zeros they could have put in front of him that would have made him re-sign. That's amazing. You know, and what was interesting about that is that he said, um, you know, Vince McMahon has this like million dollar man complex about himself where he wants to be able to buy and have anybody he wants. And Dean uh, kind of takes a shot at Brock, and he says that's why Vince pays Brock millions of dollars to ruin his company. So Dean still doesn't like Brock. And he's right. You know, Vince just wants to pay for things and, you know, just think that he can own anybody. And one of the things I've been saying on my shows for way over five years, probably five, six, seven years now, is how much I respect guys in the business like a Jericho or a CM Punk, or a Brock Lesnar, or now a John Moxley, that do not need the WWE. They've gone off and done other things, and they've never let the WWE control them. Jericho has a band. He now wrestles elsewhere. Jericho's always had outside interests outside of WWE. The Rock, same thing, got into acting, to where he didn't need the WWE to to succeed. They needed him. Brock Lesnar goes to the UFC, becomes champion. CM Punk, Leaves WWE, never looks back. Hates their fucking guts. Will probably wind up turning up at All Elite Wrestling at All Out in Chicago. And now you've got Moxley who's like, no, I'm not going to resign with you. I don't care how much money you pay me. This isn't the greatest place in the world to be. This isn't fucking Oz. You know, I want to get the hell out. This is Kansas. And I want to get the hell out of there and go to Oz. And go somewhere where I can see everything in color. And breathe the fresh air. And get a new start. Have a new lease on life. You know, what's the point of having all this money if you can't be happy so he the fact that he feels that way i respect the shit out of him for that because i love it 
when WWE comes across somebody that they can't control, that they that when they go to grab them by the balls, their hand gets swatted away. And there's only a few people that like have that power, that have that control to say, I don't fucking need you to be a success, make money, support myself, make a living. You need me. And so whenever we see guys like that come around, I'm happy. And we're probably and we're likely going to see more of those if All Elite Wrestling turns out to be a success. They're a big company that can afford to pay, pay guys, and they are now a legit alternative, not only for the fans, but for the talent to start jumping ship. You know, and, uh, and and Moxley here can be one of the first, you know, he can be the Lex Luger of this generation. Luger showing up on that very first Nitro. He can be that of this new era and this new wave of competition that's likely at our feet now. So Moxley, I thought, was carried himself well on the podcast. Like, yes, he was angry. Yes, he was frustrated. But hell, all he did was tell the truth, man. I don't even think he exaggerated. You know, you could tell in CM Punk's voice how angry he was that he was probably embellishing or exaggerating some of that. Moxley, I don't think he was exaggerating anything at all. And we all knew he was nuts. Remember the Stone Cold podcast when he was on that? I remember being a little bit frustrated with Moxley because Ambrose could not, he just wasn't acting right. He seemed like a fucking weirdo. He seemed like somebody that didn't want to talk about his past, that was embarrassed about his past. He was not cooperating with Austin. That was not the case with the Jericho podcast. He opened up. He talked like a normal person. He didn't seem weird, you know, or um, limited in any way creatively with what he could say. He seemed genuinely free, and I, I think it felt good. It was probably therapeutic for him just to be able to say these things, just to be able to say, wow, there is nothing they can do to me. Where before, if I'm employed by the company and I go on a podcast, I do an interview, maybe, I get in trouble for that. You know, if I say the wrong thing or if I slip up or I make the company look bad in any way, I'm going to get a phone call from management or I'm going to be told to delete a tweet or I'm going to be buried on TV or punished on TV anyway, something like that. He can do whatever the fuck he wants and not one stupid WWE official can call him on the phone and tell him that he's in trouble. Fuck you. That's got to feel good. That's got to feel really good. And I'm happy for him. I'm happy for him and I wish him the best. And I hope uh, whatever he does in All Elite Wrestling and New Japan is a huge deal. And I hope WWE gets to sit back and watch him and say, you know what? Maybe we should stop being stupid with talent. Otherwise, this is going to be the future of a lot of them. You can't push everybody and not everybody can be WWE champion. And I hate fans that think that everybody can be WWE champion and that the WWE title needs to pass be passed around like some sort of a participation trophy. Well, you've been here 10 years. You deserve it. Fuck that. It's about getting over. It's about drawing. It's about who should be champion. Championship material. All that shit really exists. But I definitely think WWE can use guys better. And they can use, especially creatively. But I also understand not everybody can be WWE champion. But at least try to make it to where people enjoy being there. Feel People feel like they have a chance to grow their character creatively. And they're not just showing up day in, day out. Spending two hours in hair and makeup. Eating a ton of fucking salad and catering. Going out there for one stupid segment on Raw or SmackDown and going back, you know, without any sort of joy of saying, wow, that was great. What a rush to have the crowd in the palm of my hand. I could, you know, I felt it, you know, I'm getting over as a heel. I'm getting over as a baby face. Nobody feels like that. They just walk out there, do their thing and leave. And that's it. And Ambrose said, or I'm sorry, Moxley said in Jericho's podcast that one of his big hopes for All Elite Wrestling is that they will push WWE to get better. Unlike Punk, where Punk wants WWE to fucking fall in a volcano. <laughs> Moxley does not feel like that way at all. Moxley wants the WWE to succeed, and he hopes that All Elite Wrestling will push them to do so. Jericho and Moxley both said on the podcast that they don't really consider All Elite Wrestling direct competition, but an alternative. Now, that's kind of bullshit. They're definitely going to be competition, but I I like the fact that they're trying to remind the fans, like, not, like what I've been saying, don't get ahead of yourself, don't think, that All Elite Wrestling was at one pay-per-view and have, hasn't even aired their TV show yet, is now the number one company in the world. That's the insane stupidity of the fans. So I think there's it's somewhere in between, you know? Punk trying to, you know, downplay a AEW being competition. Bullshit. Or I'm sorry, Jericho trying to downplay that. Bullshit. We saw what Cody Rhodes did. <laughs> you know, if that's not declaring war, I don't know what is. 
but they neither man in this podcast has any ill feelings towards WWE. Jericho put in 18 years there, and he understood everything that uh, Moxley was saying. He was laughing when Moxley would tell these Vince stories. You know, I will, they weren't on camera, obviously, but you know Jericho, when he's laughing, he's just nodding his head because he knows. He went through it himself. All the stupid shit he had to deal with in that company. One of the craziest stories is that story about the fine that he got with the Batista match and the cage match or whatever in like 2009. Batista told that story like that was the day that he said, fuck this company. And it just took the suck the life right out of him and said, that's it. I no longer love this. And it just uh, killed his spirit kind of thing. And uh, Jericho's been through this shit too. Totally. Um, but it was a revealing interview. He also Moxley also talked about his final days. And what I have said in my recent uh, couple of videos and in tweets is that a lot of fans, much like this podcast, they're getting really ahead of themselves. Oh, I can't wait to talk about how Moxley buried WWE and raked him over the coals. I really don't think it was that bad. And same goes for Moxley being booked on his way out. So he jobbed a few times. So what? So EC3 rolled him up and beat him. So Drew McIntyre kicked his ass a couple of times. There is nothing at all wrong with that, with losing some matches on your way out the door. Sure, that's what you're supposed to do. It's the humiliation. It's the pettiness that we see with some talent. And some talent, we don't see that. You know, all the fans thought WWE is going to be so petty. Oh, Moxley's on in AEW. And now, with this uh, interview on Jericho's podcast, for sure, a lot of fans are automatically going to think that Renee Young is in some sort of hot water. It's not her fault. This is her husband. He's got his own career. And I just don't think that with this situation, WWE is going to be that petty. Aside from taking a shot at Dean here or there, or making some sort of a joke or a reference or whatever, you know, they're not going to punish Renee Young for something that Moxley is doing, in my opinion. And I believe that every situation is different, and sometimes WWE will be spiteful in talent, or spiteful with talent, and others they won't. And I just don't think they're going to be that way, be petty like that towards Renee Young and the John Moxley situation. And I said that because of the weird way that they handled his exit, which Moxley talked about in the podcast. Jericho even said, he goes, that was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. They issued a press release announcing your departure in a few months. This was like way back in January or whenever that was. Dean Ambrose is going to leave the company when his contract expires. That shocked us. That's why we all thought it was a work. And Moxley said that. He goes, that's why everybody thought it was a work, because they've never done that before. And he still, he goes, I have no idea what they were trying to do. I don't know if they were trying to convince me to stay last minute or whatever. He said Vince even called him up right around WrestleMania time and asked him to stay a little bit longer and work the Europe post-WrestleMania European tour. And he said no. He said, no, I'm gone. Goodbye. Which was cool. Um, but as far as uh, how he was booked, I don't think it was too bad. The only thing I thought was dumb was the Nia Jax stuff. They kind of teased having a match between them. He told that story, how that all came about. And he said it was really interesting timing with him finally starting to let people know that he was going to leave. And at that point, there was only a small inner circle of people that knew that, like two or three, Vince, Triple H, and one of the writers. And then all of a sudden, he's booked in this segment with Nia Jax where he's got to take a bump for her. And he went and talked to Vince about it and the whole deal. And uh, he felt like they were just trying to bury him on the way out or whatever. And uh, he made the best of the segment and had no ill feelings towards Nia Jax about it. But there were things with his departure that he found weird. Now, me looking back, I think the Nia Jax stuff was kind of dumb. But I really don't have any issue with him having a quick upset loss to EC3. A guy who we thought would WWE be pushing by now anyway. And getting beat up by uh, McIntyre. Like, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think, uh, you know, he wasn't in the locker room shaving someone's back. Let's put it that way. So as far as what he did on his way out, I didn't think it was that bad at all. At all. But I'm reading some of this chat here. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I haven't been uh, interacting much with the chat. Just kind of reading the stuff. Kind of reading through my notes here, too, of what else he said. Um... You know, all of the storyline stuff was really ridiculous. And when he when he was pointing out how bad Vince is and out of touch he is, it is kind of scary that it does confirm what we all suspected. Because sometimes I feel like 
Vince is out of touch. That whole narrative is a little bit overused. It's not wrong, but it's like, you know, like I said, I make this comparison all the time or this analogy, how the fans sometimes take these arguments and these, these statements, they things that these things that they hear and they apply it to every single situation. And sometimes I don't think Vince being out of touch is the reason something sucks, but it's definitely the reason something sucks sometimes. <laughs> And uh, a lot of these promos, these overscripting of these promos are like that. And Vince has these ideas in his head of what these characters would say. And then he writes it down and then mock, and then Ambrose reads it. And he goes, I would never say this. This is so fucking dumb. You know, Vince's mentality is just he's never, you know, he's changed with the times business-wise. But mentality, he's just, he's just a mess. He is truly just a, a dumb old man at this point, creatively, when it comes to some of these wrestlers. And none of them have any creative influence over their own characters, character, they, the characters that they've worked hard to develop. Every single thing is being scripted for them. Ambrose even said he got some personal memo from Vince saying he must now read the script verbatim when he's in the ring. There's been some talk that uh, Sami Zayn, this past Monday night on Raw, who, uh, who acknowledged, who said AEW in his promo when he was talking to the fans, there's some conflicting reports of it was scripted or not. I felt like it was. If I'm Sami Zayn, I am not saying something like that without running it by someone. I have a real hard time believing that he just went out there and did that on his own. But then there's some. All, there's also a story that he has been given a little bit more creative freedom to go out there and say what he wants. But even if that was true, I, I just the way WWE is, and if you know how petty they are, maybe he wants to leave too. Maybe he wants to get fired. It has to be one of those two things. If Sammy truly cares about his job, then 100% he ran that idea by somebody. But if he doesn't, and he just wants to get his ass fired or get in trouble so he can leave, then hell, maybe he did say it on purpose. But for the most part, no matter who you are, they want you to read these scripts verbatim. And it sucks. And he talked about how his return was really fucked up by Seth Rollins really taking his time to deliver the line about a lunatic fringe in his corner or whatever it was. But it's piss poor writing that didn't flow well and it kind of just blew the surprise it just wasn't executed bad delivery shit like that instead of letting these guys go out there and for the most part be themselves would be so much better and that's probably what we're going to see in aew and that's what moxley said he wants aew his hope is that aew can be the anti-vince it can specifically go out of their way to do things that vince mcmahon would not do and you got guys like jericho and moxley and cody who all saw firsthand, more than anyone, the mistakes, especially from a creative side, and all the dumb bullshit they had to deal with. The last thing they want in AEW is to create that environment. So I think between those three guys, that's fucking money in the bank right there. You know, if, if they want to know what not to do to frustrate talent, you know, just ask them. All right, here's how we need to do things. Here's how we need to structure creative meetings and... Uh, and promo ideas and shit like that. We gotta let these guys be themselves. That's all you gotta do. Just do like you did in the nineties and eighties. That's all you had to do. There was a time when the shit worked. Believe it or not, you could go out there with a couple of bullet points in your head and make up the rest. Always worked before. Maybe not for Ken Patera. <laughs> or Kalisto. <laughs> or guys like that. I don't know. But uh, it, it does tend to work in wrestling, and that's what you want. You want the audience to feel it. You know, Dean Ambrose is an extremely, he, he can connect with you. He has that um, he has that charisma about him that can really connect with an audience unless he's being written to take inoculation shots in his ass. You know, but if he, if he can go out there and be himself and connect and relate to people and they can live vicariously through him, a lot of the same stuff that helped get Austin over. You know, All Elite Wrestling has a chance to do that with some of these guys now. And you're never going to see that in the WWE without some changes being made. So I think we're on the, even though this is a really frustrating time in wrestling, I think it's a really interesting time too, because now WWE's getting some pushback finally. They're starting to catch up from other angles. They even had the expose piece by John Oliver and how fucked up their dealings with Saudi Arabia is, and they're about to go over there again. They got disgruntled talent out the ass. They got another up and coming upstart company now with a cable TV deal. That's all the rage. A lot of talent wants to go there. Fans are rabidly behind them aggressively even maybe too much so behind all elite wrestling you've got so much frustration against the giant wwe that like i said nothing can happen overnight but this might translate in the next few months into some really great wrestling don't forget it was in the fall 
1995 when Nitro kicked off, and that was a pretty fun year there when things got rolling and the Monday Night Wars and all that shit. So when we get into the fall here and we near the end of the year and we move into 2020 and we see where the business is at, what it looks like, what WWE has done on their end to compete, what talent is no longer there anymore, and over to All Elite Wrestling because that's a big list too. And I'm hoping Moxley, since every single WWE employee is in his cell phone, he's texting some people. Hey, Gallows. Hey, Anderson. Hey, Nakamura. Hey, anybody, Rusev, anybody else that WWE is straight wiping their ass with that could be a huge asset to another company, why don't you come on over here to Uncle Moxley and join me in AEW? I think it'd be a lot of fun. We've got a pretty solid audience in here, too, for a Wednesday afternoon. Hey, smash that thumbs up for me, would you? And uh, hit me with a like and make sure you subscribe if you are not because I'm up here doing stuff all the time. New look channel for the summer. I'm doing some new video ideas. This is one of them. The mic drop segment has been expanded to include exclusive content that I might just record off camera, and some of it will be on camera, and some of it will be live, like this. Uh, this Day in Histories are going to start picking up as well. I'm going to do one on June 2nd and June 7th and June 27th for sure. Next month, um, all sorts of new shit coming on the channel. And then here in the next few weeks, I'm going to pick the weekly podcast back up, most likely, but also change how I structure those. You know, those were burning me the fuck out and I'm still going to do those. I'm just not going to do them to where I'm spending a long time editing them. I might just do them on camera, record them, upload them, shit like that. So there's still some changes to be made. But like I said, you're going to slowly start seeing changes creep into the channel. There's a couple of videos up in the top right hand corner and the cards there I want you to check out. I did a video yesterday on Double or Nothing and their competition with WWE and what it means and what it could mean for the future. And I also did a video on Owen Hart's, the 20 year anniversary of Owen Hart's death. Both of those are up there, so check them out. But let me go down to the chat now that I've talked about all the main points about Moxley and we'll spend a few minutes just kind of talking about the situation, what you guys think, that sort of shit. Um, yeah, we're looking good. Oh, wow, thanks for the awesome increase in likes there. You guys are the best. Ask and you shall receive. About 25 and about five seconds there. Keep them going. Thank you. Yeah, they're creeping. Nice. Appreciate it, y'all. Hey, with all with this many people in here, I think we can get it up to 200 likes. Hook a brother up. Um, but yeah, let me go down here to the chat and say hello. Did I miss any super chats, by the way? Just a couple. No, did I got you. Okay, I think we're good on that. If I missed one, just let me know. Um, thank you, Roderick, for that. I appreciate that. Sasha Banks is another interesting one. You know, she's... Uh, Unfortunately, not in a great situation like Moxley is. She can't leave. She's locked in a contract. Even if she wants to leave, she's not going to be able to turn up anywhere for a while. you got to run out your contract. I mean, if your contract is up, you don't have to worry about a no-compete. But if they do release her, she's going to have to deal with that. Um, who knows? But she's you know she's disgruntled as well. We know the Revival is pissed off. And you got other teams there and other wrestlers that just aren't doing shit. And I hope a lot of them just don't re-sign. That's what I hope. You know, I just hope there's enough talent there that cares enough to say, I know I can go, number one, make a little bit of money somewhere else, work in AEW if they'll have me, if they're a talent that's big enough to that AEW might want, because AEW does not want to get into the situation either, where they're just signing everybody. You know, because it might not, you don't want to overrun, you don't want to make the mistake that TNA did in the sense that you want to overrun your roster with former WWE guys. Every single time somebody leaves WWE, boop, they hop right over to AEW. And maybe for some talent, it should be that way. WWE is the big league, so you think the talent there is the big leagues too. But I mean, like, for example, if Titus O'Neil becomes available, like, don't bring him in. I love Titus. He's awesome. The dude follows me on Twitter. Sweetheart of a man. But do we need him in All Elite Wrestling? No. So I don't want to see them, like, take it to that degree. But I do want to see some of the, some of the more polarizing talent or a lot of the, the talent that the fans are behind and also frustrated with creatively the revivals, the Gallows and Andersons and the Shinsuke's and many, many, many other. I know those are only a few names. There's plenty more. Bobby Roode, guys like that. If they can break out and they can get away, they'll be fun to come see over in All Elite Wrestling. So I think in addition to Moxley, if you can have Punk crash that all-out party, you can grab one or two pieces of pretty sizable talent from WWE, whether it be a single star or a tag team. I think that can go a long way in the next few months. So it's going to make the, uh, it's going to make the, this fall really interesting. 
Finn Balor is another guy. He's kind of on the cusp. Like, Balor, I definitely feel like it's it's so messed up what happened to him. But at the same time, it wasn't... This one wasn't totally WWE's fault. They definitely had a hand in not making Balor what he was. But it was also the injury. You have to remember that. Had Balor not got injured, we don't know what would have happened or how long that demon character were to held the universal title. You know, he probably would have held it maybe into Royal Rumble or something like that. I don't know. So I don't know what their plans for Finn Balor were. Um, he might have dropped it to Seth and then Seth lost to Goldberg or something like that. I don't know. But when he got injured, that fucked everything up for him. And then when he came back by then, I think it was Brock was champion and he couldn't get his rematch. And then time went by and, you know, he wasn't even the demon. He was just this... Do we dare say Vanilla Midget? I saw the Super Chat. I'll get right to that chat. Super Chat from chat. So, Finn, I wish WWE could do better with. But then again, he's IC champ and decent uh, spot on the card, even though he's not main event and main eventing WrestleManias and shit like that. You know, I feel like he's got at least a good spot on the card. But then again, Moxley had a good spot on the card, and he fucking hated his life. So Balor may as well. And it all depends, too, on the status of a lot of these contracts. I know it, and they're probably public record. I can look them up, but I have no idea when Balor's contract is up and if he even wants to leave or not. Who knows? It all depends on what's in their head, too. You know, Maybe they're frustrated creatively, but maybe there's some people that also don't care. Like, yeah, fuck it. I'm getting paid. What do I care? I go out there and do the stupid shit. I don't care. You know, there, There's definitely probably that attitude here and there floating around the locker room as well. Just complacent people. I hope Finn is not one of those. But uh, thank you, Chat Site Forums, for uh, the two bucks. You are awesome. Uh, you're always tagging me and all the other podcasters and shit on Twitter all the time. Uh, talk about how we got how we got paid 500 for his last show. Yeah, that's another one. I have that written down. Um, that wasn't, again, that wasn't like another big deal to me. It was a live event. They did put it on the network. He got a $500 check. He feels like WWE might have, it might have been a little like F you to him. Or whatever, but he also just got done saying that he does not give a shit about money. He just wants to get out of there. He was even hoping when he told him he was going to leave in January that they would just send him home, write him off TV, and never have him back on again. That's what he was hoping. So he he's like, man, I can get a break and you know just go home and not have to deal with this day to day creative bullshit that I have to deal with. He wanted out. So them paying him five hundred dollars that seems low, <laughs> especially when WrestleMania paydays range in the seven figures. Apparently, he got five hundred bucks for that. I make I can make that as a fucking waiter when I served in restaurants and shit, you know? So that's dumb and everything. But again, he wanted out. He said he didn't care about the money. So that really shouldn't bother him. It's just another like stupid example of how weird everything is. But I don't think the talent is like underpaid. You know, in one area I think WWE puts takes care of people. Yes, you have to pay for your travel and all that shit. But, you know, as far as the the mid card to top card talent i think they make plenty of money i don't think there's anything to complain about about the salaries sure as hell beats what they were probably getting in the mid 90s when business was so bad wwe's got billion dollar tv deals now and shit and billion dollar deals with saudi arabia they can afford to pay the talent so i uh talent is never going to be completely happy with payoffs you go back and listen to it back in the day the click stone cold steve austin hulk hogan all of your favorites everybody who's uh your profile picture on your social media pages also complained about pay everybody complains about pay so that was another part of it to where it didn't make me give a shit any less i mean i'm, I'm so much more frustrated with wwe creatively more than anything else you know and uh, yes the um independent contractor stuff can be stupid and effed up and we know that but as far as like what the talent is paid i think they're paid fine I don't have any sympathy for the talent, you know, making more money than probably all of us to live their dream. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and Nakamura would be a, a perfect guy. He's a perfect example of somebody. Like, just get him the hell out of there. And he can do double duty too, you know, just like Moxley. He can go back to New Japan and work some all-lead shows. That would be great for him. I'm glad you said that, Rat Man. Before I get out of here, um, because I want to ask you guys, here was my plan for this Saturday. NXT TakeOver uh, is this Saturday. My plan was, I haven't even really taken a look at this card, but I love the TakeOver shows. They're great. I went ahead and took the night off of work to watch it. My plan was to come up here and live stream my reaction, but I was also thinking that maybe I just watch the pay-per-view and then come up and do a live review. 
So what would you prefer? Live reaction, live review. Um, I'm going to do one of those two on Saturday for sure. And I've been advertising a live reaction, but I started rethinking it and thought maybe I'd just hang out here and watch it myself and tweet and then come up and do a review after. Thank you for the two bucks, Looney Tune 22. Max, oh, Max Khan, what's going on, man? How are you? So you are Looney Tune. Cool. Hoping for the best for AEW, as we all are. I, um, I really hope that AEW is a success and whatever mistakes they made, they make are limited and the fans stay behind them and they can truly be competition for the WWE. That's all I want. Um, Moxley in the podcast, in the Jericho podcast, said one thing that I hope that we get out of All Elite Wrestling is that it pushes WWE to do better. He wants them to do better. His friends are there. He wants them to prosper. And that's all he wants. He wants to, uh, He wants this to be for the betterment of the wrestling business. And that's all I've said right from the very fucking start. All the other fans are here arguing and yelling it amongst themselves when I'm saying we should just enjoy the competition and realize that this is going to make some real good content for us. And it ain't going to happen overnight. All Elite has to start. WWE has to keep feeling the heat. Disgruntled talent needs to keep voicing their concerns on podcasts. And hopefully we'll start slowly seeing some changes being made internally. But we're not going to see that tomorrow. And it's just not going to work that way. So we're going to have our ups and downs in both companies. WWE is going to continue to feed us shitty Raws, shitty SmackDowns. And right now they're real bad because we're gearing up for Super Showdown, a show that I'm not going to watch, that I don't care about. It makes me dirty inside to even think about watching it. I just don't, I'm just, just turned off by the whole Saudi Arabia thing. And all of their, all their promotion right now on TV with Seth Rollins and Baron Corbin and Dolph Ziggler and Kofi Kingston, that's all for this Super Showdown. And this week on TV, we got The Undertaker on Monday Night Raw apparently promoting his match with Goldberg. I just do not care. So right now, it's just like, who fucking cares about this stuff? So we're going to continue to get shitty Raws, shitty SmackDowns, and meaningless pay-per-views for a little while. And they'll they'll hit us with a couple of good ones. We'll get a great Raw or a great SmackDown somewhere in there. We know the takeovers are going to be off the hook every time. You know, maybe we can have a good SummerSlam and a good pay-per-view here and there. And then we enter into the fall. SmackDown goes to Fox. AEW goes to TNT. And it's on, baby. And it's going to be fun. I'm happy. Now, well, thank you for that, AJ Envoy. Did I miss any other one? So you guys want live review, live reaction, live review? That seems kind of like even. Live reactions are kind of fun. I can just sit here and just casually watch wrestling, drink some beer. They're always fun. But then I usually am tired by the end of it. So I don't want to, like, stay up and talk more about the show after that and because I've already been up here for, like, three hours. So that's the only thing I kind of miss, um, having the energy to stay up, like, another hour and talk. So maybe we'll do that. So, all right, I'll, I'll plan on the reaction still. Unless something crazy happens and I change my mind last minute, but I'll plan on the reaction. Yeah, Renee, Renee Young released. No, she's not going to be released. I definitely think that all this is weird. Like I said, Jericho even said hello to Renee on the podcast. You could see, you could hear him say hello, Renee. So she was there apparently, unless he just did that to fuck with us. Um, I think uh, I think Renee's like going to be all right. I know this is not the ideal situation, WWE probably isn't thrilled that Dean Ambrose is in or that Moxley's in AEW, but they knew he would be. They knew this was a possibility. This, he's going to leave and do movies and retire bullshit. I don't know who the hell thought that was possible, but that's insanely stupid. It was never going to happen. So there's nobody in WWE that was like, jaws were dropping that he showed up at uh, Double or Nothing. Of course he was. Big deal. So I think that if they were going to punish her, they would have punished her when he first announced that he was leaving. So I just don't think they're going to be spiteful with her. With her, They can be spiteful with other people, but not with everybody. I think they like Renee. They want to keep her around. I admit that the commentary booth is not the best place for her. If they want to move her out of there, fine. But she still has value to the WWE, and I know that ESPN had interest in her at one time. They don't want to lose her. They probably do want to keep her happy. But I do wonder how it works, you know, when one of you, when you're, the person that's calling your Monday Night Raw TV show is going home and sleeping next to somebody that is a huge part of your now direct competition. It is kind of weird. And it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But right now, I don't I don't think it's a problem. And anything WWE, any issues WWE has with uh, Moxley and anything he says going forward, I don't think they should or will take it out on Renee. And just to reiterate, I don't think Moxley buried WWE. I don't think he raked him over the coals. I don't think he sounded like a bitter 
vindictive asshole like CM Punk did, who you could truly feel the anger and hate in his heart. You could feel that coming out. That's not the vibe I got from Moxley. He seemed cool, calm, collected, happy, with peace of mind, with a weight off his shoulders and felt like he could breathe for the first time in 10 years or something. He seemed very happy and very excited for the future. He did not seem like an angry, bitter mess like CM Punk did. So I thought all Moxley did was tell the truth, told Jericho all of the frustrations he had with the creative process in WWE and how fucked up the whole situation is, but didn't slander anybody or didn't uh, do anything that would cause a WWE employee to take him to court like CM Punk did to uh, Chris Amon, whatever his name is. So I thought the podcast was informative, interesting, eye-opening, and good. And I'm glad that these things are happening. Happening. Somebody needs to call WWE on their bullshit. I'm glad that people are coming out and doing this. This is what they should be doing. WWE needs to be held accountable for being assholes. 90% of the time. My God, they're assholes. So, yeah, that's where we stand. I am going to get out of here. We're going to do this less than an hour. I didn't want to stream forever because I want people to be able to come back to this video and watch and hear what I said, and I don't want it to be just two hours of me hanging out here in the chat. Plus, I've got to head to work. So, my plan is to see you guys on Saturday. I'll be up here live reacting to NXT TakeOver. In the meantime, if you want some content, I've got a 20th anniversary of Owen Hart's death video recently up a couple of days ago. And my final thoughts on Double or Nothing, the pay-per-view, the competition with WWE, everything surrounding Double or Nothing weekend and what it means going forward with WWE and the quality of the wrestling product that we're going to get as fans all around. That video is up on my page as well, so there are a lot of new videos on the YouTube page. Starting to get back in the swing of things here and get things back to normal and start launching these new ideas for the summer. So thank you to everybody for hanging out. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day and good rest of your week. And I'll catch you on Saturday for NXT TakeOver. Talk to you then. Peace.